Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> the brave few that are here. <laughs> uh, let me take a second just to introduce, first of all, Pete Chadwick, who's uh, at SUSE. He's a director uh, product management at SUSE for cloud and systems management. My name is Mark Smith. Uh, I'm a product marketing manager for SUSE OpenStack Cloud. We've got 20 minutes uh, this afternoon just to talk about the importance of containers in an OpenStack environment. And we're going to talk about whether or not containers will kill or cure OpenStack. So let me just start by uh, talking to you about something that all of you know already, right? Containers are a hot topic. They're in the news all the time. Uh, this is stuff we're all aware of. Uh, industry analysts, uh, news reports are talking about containers and their importance to the future business, to cloud native workloads, the fact that they're critical to the digital business of the future, uh, that support for containers will only grow throughout the whole of this year, and that they're now available, container platforms are available on every public and private cloud infrastructure uh, to make sure that customers are well catered for. So that's indisputable. There's a hype curve that involves containers all the time. But within the OpenStack community, they're also a hot topic. So just to put this into context, there are some uh, news reports and some headlines that talk about uh, if you have a container platform that can develop and host containerized workloads, why do you need OpenStack? So will it kill OpenStack? Well, we'll address that question today. But first of all, uh, OpenStack uh, users see containers as the top emerging technology. Uh, in the April 2017 user survey, over 75% of the users said it was their, their top emerging technology. Uh, 451 Research say that containers are being adopted three times faster on OpenStack than anywhere else in the enterprise market. In fact, 451 Research that said that back in Barcelona for the summit, uh, revised that recently in December to three to five times faster on OpenStack. Not only that, Magnum is now um, in the top two projects of interest to all OpenStack users. We could always call it the top one because it's 37% of users and the top one was 38%. So right up there, uh, at the front of all of our minds. So let's just put that into context then. We're going to role play this. Um, Pete is going to play the OpenStack guy, and I'm going to start as the business guy. So Pete, where do containers fit into OpenStack? So I think there's two key issues uh, to, to think about when you talk about containers. First of all, are you using containers to run applications, or are you using uh, containers to be a service uh, delivery platform. So we see both things happening within OpenStack. So Mark already mentioned Magnum, and that's really focused on how do I deploy Kubernetes as a service to then build applications on top of. There are also projects like Cola and Courier that are focused on how do I take the OpenStack control plane and put that in the container and get all the benefits of easy scalability, fault tolerance uh, that you get with a containerized environment. So in that perspective, I think both, both types of containers have value and fit within the overall OpenStack framework. Okay, fair enough. Well, let me change my role then. Let me talk to you now as an operations guy. Um, let's talk a little bit about service containers then. How do you build OpenStack with service containers? And why would you want to do that? Sure, so there's two things. One, we talked about it on the previous screen is, is uh, the value of doing that is the same reason that you'd want to build containerized workloads anywhere. Easy portability, um, you get some inherent scalability when you're using something like Kubernetes to manage your orchestrated environment. And it, and it just provides a simpler, a simpler platform for your developers to build out either cloud native, or as we heard today in the keynotes, even uh, more legacy stateful applications and roll them out into a, to a, uh, to a containerized environment. The, the value of that is the isolation, um, the lower resource utilization than you get with virtual machines, and ultimately flexibility and portability. The easiest way to do that today is with, uh, with Magnum. Uh, as Mark points out, it's one of the, the top, two, uh, top two projects in terms of 
intent for people to uh, integrate. We've already seen customers that have, that have installed OpenStack specifically to get access to Magnum because they see it as a very, a very powerful way to get access to uh, containerized infrastructure. And one of the real values that you get with running something like Kubernetes uh, with Magnum is in an OpenStack environment you get full multi-tenancy today so that you can have each individual development team can have their own dedicated Kubernetes cluster, which is not easy to do with native Kubernetes. Okay, thanks Pete, that's, uh, that's pretty clear. So let's, let's talk about application containers then rather than service containers, <laughs> which I think is what you're really touching on there. Um, let's talk a bit more about how OpenStack fits into that and, and what a typical use case for um, what that would look for like. For the service containers, because I talked about application containers. Yeah. I got yeah, it backwards. You did. So from a service container point of view, it really is just taking, taking looking at, at, at OpenStack as just an application. Um, it's composed of many different services, Nova, Cinder, all the ones we, you, you know about, and putting each one of those in its own individual container gives you the same kind of flexibility that you get at the application level, where you can, um, you can have that orchestrated by something like Kubernetes so that you get automatic scale, so if, you're, uh, if your cloud grows and you need to add more control um, capabilities to it, more services, uh, more endpoints, you can do that in a fairly transparent, uh, transparent fashion. Okay, so actually when you were talking about um, application containers yes. earlier, yes. Um, let's just talk a little bit about use cases then and, and, and perhaps you could just talk us through what this is all about. Sure. So, this is really what we call Kubernetes as a service. If you think about Magnum, a lot of people talk about as containers as a service, but it's not really. I mean, because it's, it gives the end user in an OpenStack environment the ability to spin up a cluster of machines orchestrated by heat, deploy Kubernetes on top of that, and then have a fully orchestrated set of, of, of cluster hosts, of container hosts, um, running, uh, a virtual, running on virtual machines. The advantage is that each individual developer can spin up their own separate uh, Kubernetes cluster. You also get the benefit within OpenStack uh, because you're using heat that if you start to see heavy demand on the virtual machines running the Kubernetes cluster, I can spin up another virtual machine, add it to the cluster, spread the workload out. So you get all the flexibility of a containerized environment with the infrastructure flexibility of OpenStack. Okay, that makes sense, all right. So um, let me go back to being a business guy then. So uh, that's kind of where we are today, what you've just described. So where are we going to head next? Will, will all workloads end up being containerized? So no, obviously we don't think that. The, there, the number of customers that have existing workloads, whether they're running in virtual machines, running on bare metal, uh, they may or may not see any value in containerizing them. I think what's really going to be they're going to focus on is to the extent that you want to divorce your infrastructure from the underlying or your application of the underlying infrastructure there's a couple ways to look at doing that we actually think that OpenStack is the ideal platform to integrate all of your workloads whether it's a stateful workload whether it's a cloud native workload whether it's a traditional virtual machine the reason for that is that OpenStack really has a set of abstraction tools that enable APIs sitting on top of the software defined infrastructure um, we talked today, we saw a demo today in the keynote, we're running Cinder as a standalone service. Um, it's part of OpenStack, but I can run Cinder natively because it provides a set of APIs that I can use to set up block devices, whether I'm running a container, a virtual machine, um, or a block device, um, but then it abstracts all the different backends that the storage providers are, are enabling so that if, I, if I'm running NetApp, or I'm running EMC, or I'm running SUSE Enterprise Storage, which is, which is uh, based upon Ceph, all of those have Manila pl or Cinder plugins so I can automatically configure a block device and attach that to my workload, whether it's a container, whether it's a virtual machine, or whether it's a, a, a bare metal server. So what you're really seeing is that, that OpenStack and the set of projects that comprise OpenStack become the unifying API or set of APIs that allow you um, to easily use a software-defined infrastructure, whether it's storage, virtualization or, or networking. So it really then brings everything together, I right? can do everything yes. on one, one platform. Yes. Absolutely perfect. Okay, so um, let's look ahead a bit further. Let's take a slightly longer range view here then. What does the future look like for containers and OpenStack? Where are we going to head as a community? I think they will live happily together forever after. 
There's clearly a value for containers, there's clearly a value for virtual machines, there's clearly a value for bare metal servers. All of those can be unified within a single infrastructure that's managed by OpenStack as we just talked about. And so what we see going forward is you're going to have an application delivery layer that can either be used for, actually you can build straight infrastructures of server-based applications where I'm building my, my workloads onto VMs. I can use uh, what we call a microservices, a custom microservices app where I'm just building my own applications running directly on courier or on uh, uh, Kubernetes and containers. Or um, ultimately you'll start to bring in um, capabilities such as Cloud Foundry. Have Cloud Foundry sitting on top of your containerized infrastructure providing a very opinionated but very productive uh, application development environment for, uh, for the development teams. All that sitting on top of a set of APIs in OpenStack that enable you to get access to the private um, software-defined infrastructure and at the same time extending over into public cloud so that you can uh, develop truly hybrid work um, workloads that span both your data center and public cloud environments. So you're actually saying there, this is a software-defined infrastructure that will lead us to hybrid cloud? Yes, uh, absolutely. Potentially because of what you've just been describing. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, um, that sounds pretty useful as a, a future for OpenStack in a containerized and non-containerized world. Yep. Okay, very good. So um, one last question then, Pete. We started off by saying that a lot of people are saying that uh, containers, if you have a platform that will host and allow you to develop containers, why do you need, uh, why do you need OpenStack? Um, so will containers kill OpenStack? No, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I think that OpenStack, first of all, consists of a number of different projects, um, some of which will clearly make sense to be uh, a set of APIs that abstract storage or abstract networking away and ideally, as, as Mark Collier was talking about, if the communities come together and work together, instead of replicating all of the good things that something like Cinder has done um, in a containerized environment, just take advantage of that and, 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 and reuse that. Um, but it also, there's also capabilities where people are going to want to run virtual machines, they're going to run, run, want to run bare metal servers, and, and having all of those coordinated through all of the projects that OpenStack provides, I think will continue to provide value. Containers just enhance that overall value proposition. And I'm going to sum up with everything that Pete just said there, no. <laughs> <laughs> so really good. Okay, now, um, you can tell, I think, from the few minutes we had to talk about containers and OpenStack here, that Pete knows what he's talking about. Um, we are on booth six, just a little ways over there. Uh, we have a whole bunch of other systems engineers, developers and technical people, all involved with Container as a Service, um, uh, Kubernetes, uh, Magnum, and OpenStack. Please, uh, if you'd like to come along and talk to us, we'd be delighted to uh, have a more in-depth conversation, or you can just grab us as we get off the stage. Thanks very much for, for listening. Thanks, everyone. We really appreciate it.